from the program we are going to have three and uh, uh, well, there is nothing you have to prepare for them just uh, popcorns and then uh, watch the discussion and participate in it so without further delay it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Flavia Marchitti who is uh, currently a postdoc at uh, uh, the University of Campinas in Brazil uh, and today uh, she's going to talk about um, the phylogenetic patterns and how to understand them using uh, microevolutionary models. So thank you very much, uh, Flavia, for being with us and for giving this seminar. Thank you, Jakku. Thank you for the invitation. And please check if the screen, share screen is working. Is it fine? Okay. So I'll be talking about um, the, the, just let me put you on the side here, sorry. So I'll be talking about these uh, phylogenetic patterns uh, using uh, evol an evolutionary model. Um, and I've been working uh, with, with this topic in the last, in the past five years. But I'm very interested in many topics talk, uh, explained and exposed here in this, in this winter school. And I'll be clear about that in the next slides. So I'm very grateful to thank lots of collaborators and mentors that I had during my lifetime. Uh, the list is longer than, than you can see here, fortunately. And I'm also very happy to to be to have the finance of uh, supporting grants in Brazil, and to have the opportunity to go overseas to study. And this is not a great time for science in Brazil, and maybe not for many places around the world. Uh, so I'm very grateful to to be financed by by Papes Pentaps here. And so during this this winter school, we've listen a lot about coexistence between different species. How can we have um, different species sharing resources and still coexist in the same area or in the same, uh, uh, in the same environment? And I'm very interested in this topic as well, but I'm also very interested in how these species form, how they appear the first time. And studying uh, the, the, the species formation and how they, these species coexist, uh, I've been working with uh, geographic models of speciation, modes of speciation. And I've been working with neutral models to form a backbone to understand non-neutral models, how we can learn from neutral models from the absence of competition, absence of any other forces, to understand how these things will change the species formation. And, sorry. And uh, the species diversity form uh, patterns, for instance, patterns that can be observed in phylogenetic trees. We see different species forming and they are related to each other in such way that can be described by these phylogenetic trees. And there are many forces shaping uh, and process shaping these, these patterns that we observe. For instance, uh, how species that coexist in the same area, how they diversify in different species. And what are the signatures that we can have, for instance, from species that don't share the same area. And with this, uh, I'm, the main uh, line of my research nowadays is to, under, is to understand how this macro, we can link the, link the macroevolutionary patterns and the microevolutionary forces. And this fills a gap that exists in the literature called the micro macro gap. It's too hard for me to say that, but I think you got it. <laughs> and when we talk about speciation, when we talk about diversification, usually we, we think about the geographic configuration. We usually learn that the species form when you have some barrier 
that separate individuals in two different areas. And these individuals accumulate differences. And once they are together again, uh, they don't recognize each other as individuals of the same species. This is known as allopatric speciation and usually is invoked to explain how uh, a species form. But there's another form, and, and this is likely um, the, the process that happened with the chimpanzees and bonobo um, apes in Africa that were divided by the Congo River and speciated. And, but there's another form of speciation called sympatric speciation. So the sympatric speciation happens, or it doesn't happen, <laughs> it depends if it exists, uh, uh, when individuals share the same area. And there is a debate in the, in the literature if this is an important force for speciation to happen, if it really exists. But I think before this discussion, before this debate, we need to learn uh, what are the, how it happens, if it happens, how it happens, and what are the signature it leaves for us to understand that it happened. So that's why I've been working with uh, models in sympatric speciation to understand how we can then deny this is the process that is shaping uh, evolution in, in many species uh, or in many phylogenetic trees. And one of the most well-known uh, sympatric speciation models was proposed by Dickman and Bell in 1999, uh, where they used a model where they included assertive mating, which is the individuals, they choose sexual partners based on how similar they are. They also included gene linkage between the mating character and the ecological character and also included competition, the model, to understand if individuals sharing the same space could then split in different species. And they showed that with these ingredients, they could observe uh, these species formation, these bifurcations on the ecological character. However, earlier than that, in 1991, Higgs and Derrida, um, also known as the Hida higgs model, uh, proposed that sympatric speciation could happen under a neutral model. And maybe some of you will think, oh, neutral models are useless. They don't show us anything. But I think we can learn a lot from neutral models to then understand on neutral models. And that's why I like this, this model a lot. So uh, the Hida Higgs model uh, proposes that uh, we can define individuals by a very large genome as large as infinite genome uh, that have uh, the, the, each gene in this genome can have a positive one or a minus one allele in, in their positions. And they show, and I tell you how, uh, this a population of M individuals can then uh, split uh, in, in groups of different individuals that we will call species here. And they do these uh, require a simple thing that is a minimal similarity between individuals to reproduce. They do not prefer to reproduce with the most similar, but they have, they must have a minimal similarity to reproduce. So what happens in this model is that we have two individuals that are aploid individuals. So they have only one string that defines the genome. The genome, the genome is bialelic, as I told you. And we can compute the similarity between two individuals for the reproduction. So here, individuals alpha and beta, they uh, have similarities in some positions, here and here, but they have some dissimilarity in other positions, for instance, in here. But if they have a minimum required similarity for the reproduction, they can then mate and form an offspring for the next generation. And this offspring will have the alleles uh, from their parents uh, with uh, a probability of a half it comes from parent alpha and a probability of a half it comes from uh, the parent beta. And eight of these alleles will have a chance of mutation given by new. 
So here, for instance, the individual should be a positive one in this allele, but it, it should be a negative one in this allele, but it became um, a positive one because of the mutation. And with this, uh, I should stop the video first, sorry. With this, starting in a very, uh, sorry, I don't know how to reproduce it again, but starting with a very high similarity, all individuals are very similar. Passing the time with the sexual reproduction and with the mutation rate, uh, we get uh, individuals uh, that have a lower similarity between each other than a given point that is defined by the, the, the minimal uh, uh, similarity that we define for the reproduction. So these individuals that have uh, the similarity between each other is that where we see uh, a species formation. So we get individuals that cannot reproduce to each other. And so with this simpler model, the Hida and Higgs have uh, shown that with the sexual reproduction, with uh, a minimum similarity between the sexual patterns, and with a very large genome, as large as infinite, we can observe that uh, we'll have groups of individuals that are dissimilar to each other and cannot reproduce to each other. We can observe speciation with no uh, geographic uh, structuring here. So in a sympatric mode of speciation. And as you can see, uh, the, the infinite genome is a, a very large cost paid here to have a speciation under a, sympat under a sympatric situation. So something that started with uh, Marcus Aguiar in the last in the past 10 years, he decided studying uh, this uh, the Higgs model in a modified version. So we try to uh, work with a model where it's more real, more close to real <laughs> situation, where genomes are no more infinite. They are like finite, finite genomes. So we have a genome that have like B lossy and Exactly as in the same model of the Hida Higgs, we have two individuals that we reproduce. They must have a minimum similarity for the reproduction. And there is a mutation rate that can change the offspring uh, inherited allele. And with this, uh, Marcus shows that uh, it's possible to have not infinite uh, genomes and still have sympatric speciation. So he shows that as we uh, have lower genome sizes for a fixed number of individuals, we have to, we must have a, a lower mutation rate as well to have speciation happening. And the other thing that is important is that for a given uh, fixed mutation rate, as the genome size increases, the lower the number of individuals required to speciation to happen under a sympatric mode. And this is something important. We show this is not, it's not required anymore to have um, uh, an infinite genome for, for the sympatric speciation to happen. So it's more close to real world. And also uh, something that Marcus, Marcus decided studying was to understand how how we can enhance, how can we force a speciation, uh, putting some structure on the, uh, on, the spatial, uh, on the spatial area where individuals live. What about if we decrease the sympathy level somehow? And he has shown that if we put a radius uh, around the neighborhood and in the neighborhood of a focal individual for the reproduction, forcing this individual to look for a partner, for a sexual partner around this radius. And we can change this radio for a small radius. Uh, can, can we observe this two speciation happening? So here we are decreasing the sympathy level, but we, are still, we still have individuals in the, same, in the same area. And he shows that when we have a mating ratios, 
uh, a smaller rating, a mating radius for looking for the sexual partner. You observe that the genome size required for observing speciation is lower. So we can model uh, the SIMPA tree somehow using small genomes and some structuring on the space for uh, observing speciation. And more than that, he shows that in a given amount of time, uh, if the radius is small, we observe more species, and these species are more structured in the space than we, if we have a larger radius uh, in the same time uh, observing this one. So this was very interesting and very, very important to, uh, to help us to develop the other uh, research that we did in, in the past years. And one of them was trying to, uh, to do that thing that I showed you before, to look for some relationship between species and how this relationship between species could be related to the geographic mode of speciation. So uh, we observed that the species were forming through time in, in a spatial model. And we also observed that, uh, that I told you before, uh, when we have um, uh, a spatial configuration, uh, we can observe that as larger is the, the, the radius of the individuals to look for partners, the less the species are formed. And also when we observe a smaller genome, uh, it takes a longer time to a species to form and find an equilibration of the number of species formed. And this was very important and we were interested in relating this um, these observations with the phylogenetic trees of the species that were formed in, in these spatial areas. And so we did, uh, we developed methods to, um, to construct the phylogenetic trees under this uh, speciation model uh, and this individual based model. So um, we developed a method where we could record all the speciation and extinction events during the, the evolutionary time. So we could say which species came from whom and if, for instance, extinction events were happening and how long it take to one species to form and then to form another one. What are the, the times of this, of this lens, of this branch lens? And developing this method, we can also annotate more information during the evolutionary model and have um, a more concise information by the most recent common ancestor. And, and we observed that these two methods, which are the true phylogenetic tree, he presented here by recording all the speciation events and annotating more concise information, the most recent common ancestor, uh, we could use information from uh, the phylogenetic trees to compare these two methods. So uh, using, for instance, uh, metrics to describe the branch lens, for instance, we have the, an acceleration metric or the, alpha, the gamma statistics that define us that the phylogenetic tree for us uh, that describes to us that the phylogenetic trees has longer brands or smaller brands is more accelerated or decelerated uh, phylogenetic trees. And also uh, information about the imbalance of these phylogenetic trees. How low is the imbalance of these phylogenetic trees and how caterpillar is the format of these uh, phylogenetic trees. So using these, these metrics to describe the phylogenetic trees, we could see that uh, annotating all the events are also annotating more concise information by the most recent common ancestor uh, was very similar. We could use the most concise one. And here I show you um, very uh, happily that this annotating all the events, so having the true phylogenetic trees uh, presents to us um, the same uh, using uh, the, the, the most recent common ancestor presents as the same uh, traits of, um, about the game statistics, statistics that is about the brand lens 
and also about the balance of these phylogenetic trees. So these methods are very similar and it helped us a lot to, to get information and do simulations more fast. So as I told you, I was interested in understand how um, these radios of the mating range could uh, change the phylogenetic trees. So I, would, I was interested in understanding how parapetic and sympatric speciation were different uh, in terms of the phylogenetic trees formed after, after the process. So just reminding you, we observed that we would have less species under uh, uh, larger mating radios and also would take a longer time for small genomes to form the number of species that we observe in the calibration time. And something very interesting happened when we did the simulations after that. We observed that there is a signal here observed mainly in the uh, radius, meaning the parapetric sympatric uh, level of uh, the spatial use, uh, where we observed that as more sympatric is the phylogenetic tree, the larger the radius, it means that more tipi are the phylogenetic trees. They have this format here. The smaller the, the radius, it means the more parapetric is the speciation uh, in, in our model, the more steamy are the phylogenetic trees. And we also observe that um, the genome size, we, we can observe here the same radius and different genome size that uh, increases um, from here to here from orange to blue, we observe that it affects both the acceleration and the balance of phylogenetic trees. And we compare this to empirical phylogenetic trees, adaptive and non-adaptive phylogenetic trees. And we observe that uh, we could have, we could observe some patterns in, in, in our data. And observing especially, uh, Oh, this is, these are the trees that we worked with. And we observed that the higher the, the genetic flow during the speciation time, uh, the more balanced were the phylogenetic trees. While the less um, genetic flow happened during the, um, the speciation uh, time of these empirical trees, uh, the more unbalanced were the phylogenetic trees. And this was very related to uh, the radius of the mating range that we had here. So it seems, um, and in our model, we can observe uh, some signatures of the geographic mode of speciation. And maybe there are some signatures out there in the phylogenetic trees that we have uh, in databases that we can um, relate to the geographic mode of speciation. So I was very interested in, in these results that we have about the sympatry and the parapetry. But I was also interested to understand, OK, how can we tell um, about the barriers, about islands, about things? If we have some barriers uh, defining our space, can we detect some, something in, in our phylogenetic trees? So if we have a lopa tree, so going back more close to the real world, if we go to the alopa tree, can, can we observe uh, some pattern in the phylogenetic trees? And by the results that I've just shown you, I, I was expecting that as we impose alopa tree, as we decrease the radius, as we increase the um, the, the structuring in this space, I was expecting that we would observe um, that phylogenetic trees will become more steamy. So I would expect that given a lopa tree speciation uh, model, I would have more uh, steamy phylogenetic trees. And then uh, we performed our model in this uh, structure space. And we observed that contrary to what we will, of our expectations, we observed more uh, balanced phylogenetic trees. And I think here is where we can see it more, more clearly. 
So we observed that groups of species, uh, sometimes called deems, were uh, observable from the phylogenetic trees. And something very interesting could be detected when we um, put the, the balance of these phylogenetic trees according to the number of species. It's well known that the balance of phylogenetic trees, it varies with the number of species, even in a, um, in a normalized metric. But it's still, uh, when we did this, when we put the, the, our, the results of our simulations here, you observe that uh, for a given number of species, those that were structured in more genes had a smaller um, balance or unbalanced metric than those uh, not structured in, in genes, just in one gene. And it was interesting to observe that for the uh, Hawaii, some Hawaiian species, uh, such as the Silver Sword Alliance, the Tetragnathus spiders, and the Stichta lichen, uh, that are very uh, very split in different islands in, how, in the Hawaii, we could relate it that uh, these species have been formed in, in different things. They did, and it could be detected by their uh, balancing, uh, by the balancing of their phylogenetic trees. However, for some other species, for instance, for the finches, for the diving finches, we didn't observe uh, the, the the we couldn't relate the balance of the phylogenetic trees with the many islands where they deformed. So maybe, uh, and we explored it in the paper, uh, maybe the, this information was erased from the phylogenetic trees. And contrary to our expectations, the, uh, the alpha value that is related to the branch lengths of these phylogenetic trees didn't change a lot, it's true that the variation did, did, but the, we didn't change, we didn't see any change in the, in the mean value of the, of the alpha value. And so it was a surprising result. And uh, when running these models, we observed that we are not only creating new species, we are also losing some diversity somehow. And the diversity was, um, was being lost by different methods. And the most well-known and the expected one was the extinction. So some species were formed and passed at some time, they would disappear as the number of individuals decreased. And other process such as reverse and fusion that I will call uh, broadly as hybridization process, we observed that some species uh, somehow were being split it and then joined again in another species. So we were farming species, but then we are losing them by hybridization. And together with a student, we decided to study how frequent these this things were. So the species uh, could be defined somehow as the group of individuals that have some genetic flow between them. It, is not necessarily a direct flow, but it must be some somehow uh, some flow between different individuals. For instance, this one and this one, they have a genetic flow through this uh, third individual here. And so a species uh, could form and the individuals were linked by uh, genetic flow. And we observed that the hybridization could be defined that uh, when we have a species formation, such as this blue one, but then reverse it somehow to the species that it came from. So this is um, the most typical hybridization process that is that we, uh, we usually call fusion here. And the extinction is really the disappearance of a group of individuals that by fluctuation, they just disappear. So we could have uh, in our phylogenetic trees, these three processes, the extinction where individuals uh, disappear just by fluctuation of the number of individuals uh, in that species, the fusion where uh, a species splits into two and then uh, fuses into one again, 
And the reversal that requires uh, two speciation process, which is easier to see here, and then a fusion between the oldest one with the new one. It's not a fusion between the newest species, but a, a fusion, <laughs> a hybridization between the most recent and the most, uh, uh, and, and the, the, or the, the species that originated these two. So, what we could see is that uh, extinction happens all the time. And it's basically independent of the genome size. We see some difference here. We observed that smaller genomes have a lower extinction rate, but it's not so different as, for instance, fusion and reversal. So fusion and reversal, they happen, these hybridization modes, uh, this hybridization process happen all the time, but fusion happens more and reversal gets uh, an equilibration. And we observed that the fusion is more common as a smaller genome. And we also observed that as expected, the population size uh, during the extinction happens more frequently in the small population sizes. So just before uh, the, the event happened, the, during, if the event was an extinction, the population size is likely a small population size. While fusion and reversal, it happened in any uh, population size that we had. And the extinction and fusion and reversal didn't change a lot on the branch length of the, uh, of the species that, where that event happened. Uh, more frequently, uh, extinction could happen uh, in species that were very old or very new. And fusion and reversal seems to happen in more new species, more recent species. So I've shown here that the neutrality help us to understand how the genetic fluctuation and population size fluctuation, also known as genetic drift or uh, ecological drift, could lead us to, um, to structures of phylogenetic trees and how this extinction, fusion, and reversal could happen in, in, during this process. And it helped us to understand, to, to form the theory, understand uh, more broadly how we could then develop uh, non neutral models, understand more, uh, understand better non neutral models. And in our group, we did this in, in two different ways. And uh, I will show you the results um, by Deborah principally. I, I think it's just participating here. And also work, a work that is being developed by my student nowadays. Um, so we had the backbone to understand how genetic interactions, for instance, the metanuclear interactions, uh, could reflect on the phylogenetic trees. And I, we've been studying as well how the cooperation evolution is linked to the diversification or to the formation of new species. So I'll start with uh, Deborah Principe work. Uh, so they developed this very nice model where the individuals, they have not only um, the, the normal uh, uh, genome that is called the nuclear DNA, but they also have the mitochondrial DNA. And usually the mitochondrial DNA is uh, inherited by the mother. And uh, these DNAs, uh, they must have some, some compatibility, the nuclear and the mitochondrial one, because the respiration, a very important process, is uh, it's a link between the, the, the proteins and everything that is uh, necessary for the respiration process made by the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA. So they must have some compatibility uh, between them. And uh, using this, uh, the difference, the compatibility between these, uh, these two DNAs, uh, Deborah, Deborah de defined that the individuals that have a better, um, a smaller distance between these genomes or a more uh, coupled DNAs, uh, they, they would have a larger fitness that should be defined by a function. And 
Again, individuals can be defined in the space. And something very interesting that, that they observe is that, is that uh, as we increase uh, the force of the selection and, and, the, and the force of the selection is defined by the, uh, how broad is this fitness here. So as we increase uh, the, the, the force of the selection um, on the uh, genome and the nuclear and mitochondrial genomes, uh, we observe less species. So here, the larger, the smaller the value of a sigma here, the larger the selection force. And also, uh, a species that were, uh, and the, oh, sorry, and the ni value here is when we have no interaction between the nucleus and the, and the mitochondria. And also, they observed that extinction were more frequent when we had selection but not exactly in the higher selection in the most for the, the greater force of selection. Uh, they observed that uh, intermediate values of selection uh, provoked more extinctions in, in this model. And they also observed that uh, the phylogenetic trees were affected by the force of selection between uh, mitochondria and the nucleus. And so the, uh, comparing with uh, when we have no interaction between these two genomes, uh, when we have uh, a selection force, the, the balance of the phylogenetic trees was, the unbalanced metric of the phylogenetic trees was lower, and also the phylogenetic trees were more TP. And this is very interesting. And I think this is uh, how, it, we can summarize one of her results. And uh, when we, we compare the coupled uh, part of the DNA uh, under a strong selection, and when we have no interaction between mitochondria and the nucleus, we observe that the mutation rate present uh, on, on, the, uh, on the genomes that were linked uh, decrease the, the mutation rate of the mitochondria and of the nuclear uh, DNA. And also comparing inside the same individual, uh, they observed that in the end, the selection is decreasing the mutation rate, is purifying somehow uh, the, the DNA formed in this species. And Something very interest, interesting about the mitochondrial DNA is that they, they can be used in, in, in biological environments and in real environments uh, for identifying species. And this is something that they have shown that the mitochondrial DNA is, has a higher matching with the uh, DNA of the uh, nuclear part. And so someone could, you, could use the barcode, the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA for barcode, yes, but it's not necessary. And this is something very impressive. It's not necessary that this, these two genomes interact. Even when there is no interaction, there is a matching ratio between these two DNAs. And just to, to finish with my, uh, my last work here, uh, I've been working the last years uh, to understand how uh, cooperation evolves. And this is uh, something impressive that happens in the most variety of species. You can observe, for instance, uh, immunoptera that interact with each other. You can observe mammals that uh, cooperate uh, with each other. And Understanding how cooperation happens in nature help us to understand how we can force cooperation in human populations. Maybe it's a dream, but it's something that we could say that we can learn for nature. So usually the cooperation evolution is studied um, using uh, evolutionary game theory. So in evolutionary game theory, uh, we say that we have individuals that cooperate and some individuals that don't cooperate, they're called defectors. And um, 
in a given amount of time, depending on the of the interactions between these individuals, we will observe that one of these strategies will be uh, stable. And usually, we studied how we uh, we studied systems where the defection is uh, is the stable strategy. And one of the most well-known games is called um, uh, it, it's represented by this by this payoff matrix, where we have uh, the two strategies, cooperators and defectors. And we say that a defector uh, receives uh, a payoff of five when interacting with cooperator, and it receives a payoff of one when interacting with another defector. And the cooperator here uh, receives a, a payoff of three when interacting with another cooperator, and the cooperator receives zero when interacting uh, with a defector. And thinking that these columns here represent populations, uh, we can see if the strategies in the rows can invade the populations defining the columns. And usually in, in this type of game, call it the prisoner's dilemma, what we observe is that uh, independent of what happens, the defection is the stable strategy because the defector can invade a population of cooperators and a defector can invade and be stable in a population of defectors. So this is the final result usually and something that has been studied in, I don't know, in the last 30, 40 years, I cannot calculate things now, but <laughs> in many years uh, and, uh, and is, is how to, how we can have the cooperation evolve in situations where we are expecting uh, the defection to be stable. And Novak and many collaborators have shown that the spatial structure can be an important force for establishing some cooperation where only defection was expected. And so using this uh, simpler form of the prisoner's dilemma, where we have one here and a B value that is uh, varied here. Uh, Novak and collaborators have shown that even for values where we are expecting uh, defection only, we could observe some cooperation if the interactions were defined in the space. Oh, if the interactions and the payoffs gained by the individuals were defined by a neighborhood. And even for higher values of B here, where only, again, only defection was expected because of the spatial structure, we could observe some, some formation of uh, this, this group of cooperators. And so we decided studying these uh, in our model, in our individual based model. So if we've included, uh, in the end of the genome, these two traits, the cooperation and the defection, that defines the payoff that each individual gets in, in their neighborhood. So again, using the same uh, uh, payoff matrix used by um, Novak and collaborators, we observe that the spatial structure uh, could form, still form species under this non-neutral model, but under a game situation where individuals have some fitness because of interaction with others, the number of species, uh, the number of species forming is usually, is usually is smaller. And the cooperation frequency maybe is not clear here because I've started in the number one and not in the number zero. But when we start with the same number of cooperators or the same frequency of cooperators, uh, under a neutral game or uh, the absence of game or under a neutral model, we observe that the cooperation uh, keeps the same frequency for the, for the whole time. While uh, for the uh, game model that is also spatial as Novak did, we observe that there is a, a value of P which defines uh, values of P uh, where we were expecting defection, but we still could observe some cooperation. And these values are um, uh, 
different of those observed by, by Novak. And I'll explore more of that. Uh, we also observed that the species could form, so we could, develop, we could uh, draw their phylogenetic trees. And this is something very impressive. We observed a very different um, balance during the species formation and also uh, uh, more accelerated phylogenetic trees. So we could detect somehow, as Deborah did in her work, uh, that when we include some, um, some selection here, when we include some, some fitness here, uh, there are things that, can, that are detectable in the phylogenetic trees. And so the phylogenetic trees here are reflecting how the spatial structure and cooperation evolution affect uh, the phylogenetic tree. And something uh, we are still interested in is understanding how the absence of the structure can affect the, not only the, the, the formation of species, but also the cooperation evolution. And so doing a, a greater uh, neighborhood uh, for the species to the mating range and also for computing the payoffs of these individuals. Um, interest and uh, Louise uh, is developing this work, my student. I'm interested in, we are interested in understanding how species form. And this is not anymore a, a, a neutral model. So species cannot form, but we, we have many clues that we, they will form. And we are interested also if there are patterns in these species that are formed. Uh, uh, do we observe more um, defectors in some species? Do we observe my, more cooperators in other species? And how these uh, leave signatures in the phylogenetic trees? Is it a conservative trait? Can we uh, relate the, uh, the cooperation or defection as an ancestral trait of uh, a given, uh, a given uh, group of species here. And so this is the kind of thing we, we are exploring now. And, and in the end, another student of mine will be studying how uh, the cooperation and the hybrid, uh, the cooperation uh, can affect the extinction and hybridization rates. Can, are they, is it more frequent that the cooperators will be extinct? Uh, is it more frequent that hybridization happens in sympatric speciation or uh, in parapatric speciation? So this is the kind of questions that I'm, I'm interested in now. So just to summarize, I think I have um, two minutes here. <laughs> uh, I've, I've shown you that um, competition or natural selection uh, is not necessary for uh, sympatric speciation. And this is uh, a result of uh, the Hida Higgs model. And sorry, uh, I've shown you that even in finite genomes, uh, when we have a given genome size, a given mutation rate and a given number of individuals, uh, we still can have sympatric speciation. And spatial structuring, when we define a mating ratio, radius for, for the individuals, we can have uh, more species. Uh, we can find signatures of the geographic mode of speciation in phylogenetic trees. And I've shown you that allopatry and parapatry affect mainly the balance of the phylogenetic trees. And um, almost in the end, I've shown you that extinction and hybridizations, uh, they can be characterized in neutral models and we can then explore uh, non-neutral models. Uh, they can be interactions between the same, inside the same individual, or they can be through interactions between different individuals. But all this knowledge that we accumulated studying neutral models has helped us to understand and to perform the, the non-neutral models. So I'm ready for any questions from you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Flavia, for the 
a very nice talk. So uh, we have time for questions. So there are uh, a few from the chat, which uh, I'll start reading from you. And then if anyone wants to ask uh, uh, anything, can uh, raise the hand uh, on Zoom. So Elvira is uh, asking, um, do you use empirical phylogenies without dating to compare uh, with the simulation of these models? Uh, the empirical data without dating to compare with simulation. No, it's with dating. Uh, we, we use with dating. Uh, and then there is uh, Margaret who is asking, uh, I noticed you made use of the random forest model on the phylogenetic trees. Uh, I wish to understand why you made the choice. Also, did you try other models? And uh, what were your discoveries? Oh, um, maybe I don't know what is a random forest model. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if uh, maybe she can ask if. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, Margaret, please. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, if you check, I don't know the slide number when you were showing the, the inheritance from the uh, phylogenic trees. Is actually a random forest model that we use to model those trees. I don't know oh, if you can go back to the slide. I can't really get the exact yes. slide. Yeah, those uh, branching that you had. Like, uh, Is it in the beginning? Yeah, kind of in the beginning. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm yeah, sorry. before this slide, yes. Backward. Okay, yeah, 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 here. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I this one? Say, yes, under the, the, yeah. And there's a place that is actually stated that you use a random forest and Arab model to actually get the models all sorted out. So I actually wish to understand why you chose the random forest. Oh, so this is how uh, we represented uh, the, this method that we call it. It's also known as this the most recent common ancestor. And I don't know if it's exactly the same thing of the random forest model, but we, we get individuals um, of our uh, simulation, and then we trace back uh, from which species it came from. So for instance, this individual here, um, let's say the, the yellow one here, maybe it's easier. The yellow one here, when we trace back uh, this group of individuals that are represented by this, this guy here, um, and when we trace back, it came from a speciation that happened just in the beginning. And uh, the blue one here, we can see that the individuals of the blue one here uh, came from uh, yellow individuals. So when we join the information, so we have the information based on this individual here that the speciation happened two times before the present time. So we can say there is a distance between the blue and the yellow one uh, that happened two times before now. And this is just like following back the, the species that identifies uh, the, the, the species of the, an individual and which is the ancestor of the species of that individual. I don't know if it's the same of the friend of forest. I didn't know. Yeah, it, it is, but uh, I think in further, in further slide two, uh, you, it was actually stated specifically. So I can't really remember the slide. But all the same, I've sent you a private message and I hope you reply like, because I want to know your your choice of model there are actually several models that are doing this but uh, yeah we know generally the random forest tends to be like the most convenient and most accurate in terms of what we do but there are other also other models that were good uh, that of choice so i just wanted to understand the choice but all this in thank you 
So uh, just one more thing, maybe it can help you uh, to understand what are what are, was our choice. So uh, this this information. So using all the events. So recording all the events uh, takes a lot of time and takes a lot of uh, information that we need to record in our computers. So doing this helps us a lot. But we also explored, for instance. Uh, genetic distances okay, yeah, by yeah, different slide, metrics. Slide exactly. Can you take the first slide. You said the normalized random forest. Yeah, that was why I had to ask why random forest. Why random forest exactly? So yeah, because we we have the information of the genomes of the individuals, we could do this uh, genetic distance between individuals of different species. But we've noticed that. When we compare to the real phylogenetic trees that is uh, made during the, uh, the evolutionary process, when we can record all the events, uh, we observe that this, um, the, the, the phylogenetic trees made by the most recent common ancestor were more similar to the real phylogenetic trees. That's why we decided to use uh, this method to construct our phylogenetic trees. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Great. We have uh, uh, time for more questions. Since nobody's asking, I can ask my question. So uh, I, uh, in one of the um, uh, first plots you showed about the model uh, where you compare with the empirical networks, you had uh, adaptive and non-adaptive uh, networks. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. How trees. <laughs> I also say networks, but it's trees. <laughs> yeah, trees, sorry, sorry, trees, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, there is gene flow, so they are also networks in some sense. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have the, the adaptive and non-adaptive. So I'm not sure how these two are classified, but I would have, I mean, the word adaptive suggests that there should be some uh, uh, at least difference in the structure, why it seems that you didn't see any difference between the two. So I was wondering. So, yeah. uh, uh, I, I can go back to that slide as well. Um, but it, it's true. So when we decide to compare to adaptive and adaptive radiations, it's below here. Uh, it was because uh, we were evaluating our phylogenetic trees. Let me show here. Uh, we were evaluating our phylogenetic trees uh, under this, uh, when, when they reached the equilibration time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were interested in this uh, radiation process. When it takes longer time, uh, you see that they don't form new species. So the phylogenetic trees, you reach somehow some, some uh, structure that is somehow fixed. And we decided to study how radiations uh, could, how did, what are the, the, the signatures in, during the radiation. And then when we go to the literature, <laughs> you only find or mainly find adaptive radiation. And maybe it's because we believe that the main process happened, happened under adaptive radiation. So usually when they say adaptive radiation, they, they are informing us there is somehow some selection uh, during the process. And the non-adaptive radiation, so this information of adaptive and non-adaptive radiation were also um, um, gotten from the, got from the literature. So as the authors inform us, oh, it's adaptive, it's non-adaptive. And if you see in our table, oh, maybe I should, in the presentation mode, we have uh, more usually more adaptive than non-adaptive networks, and it's true uh, we can see some structure here um, in the adaptive uh, uh, phylogenetic trees that are the triangle ones uh, that is given by the natural selection, not by the spatial structure, um, but. It was interesting to understand and to see that maybe the genetic flow uh, that can be defined as low or high defines better how um, 
this structure of the phylogenetic more than if it's adaptive or non-adaptive. Maybe the genetic flow, flow is the most important thing here. And we made this classification of the genetic flow based on the how many um, islands or how, how was the structure during the, the radiation process. Mm -hmm. Did I respond to your question? Sorry. Yes, yes. No, no, it, <laughs> I, I was, I mean, I think it was uh, surprising uh, that there was no difference between the adaptive and non-adaptive, right? Because they both match uh, the neutral case. Yeah, and I think because we have this information that maybe this space uh, the spatial structure is very important. We have more, more, we are more prepared to evaluate the non-neutral models and understand what are the signatures on the non-neutral models that are not given by the space. Yes. Yes, completely agree. Great. So is there any more, any other question? Okay, so if not, uh, let me thank uh, Flavia again for the very nice seminar. Thank and you. Uh, um, we are now going to take a break for uh, one hour and a half. So it's going to be a long break. You can even take a walk out of the screen and go out. And uh, uh, we are going to start again at uh, 3.45 with the second lecture by Alvaro Sanchez. So thanks uh, to everyone. Uh, see you in an uh, uh, hour and a half. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.